Felicia, you can see it. You can hear me. We're good. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to be taking a walk along the trails of Big Talbot Island. Uh, something I would really prefer to be doing right now, but I'm glad that I'm here to talk about Big Talbot Island. Instead, what I'm probably going to give is more of a kind of a traditional PowerPoint presentation to really draw upon the archaeology and some of the visual imagery of the island so you can get a sense for what's there. But really, just keep in mind that the next time that you're on Big Talbot Island, that beneath the maritime hammock, you know, canopy, that beneath the scrub vegetation, there is really a rich, rich indigenous history that extends back into well into you know, pre-Columbian time. Uh, throughout the island, there are kind of what we call mid or gar really garbage piles that are going to consist of broken pieces of pottery, discarded shell, animal bones that really mark the presence of former Native American community that really existed at key points throughout Native American history of northeastern Florida. So just kind of keep all of that in mind as you really stroll through the island and really enjoy enjoy it. I'm just going to touch upon two of the major archaeological sites or the major you know, Native American communities that are that are on the island. Okay. So really, I just want to give you a quick list that what I'm drawing on is kind of firsthand experience that we at the University of North Florida have been involved in. So since 1998, uh, as you can see here, we've had seven different kind of field seasons. Most of these are summer field schools for students. However, this year we're actually in the field now. So our summer field school got moved to the fall. So we're in the field three days a week. So um, I really had the, the, the privilege of being a part of all of these projects. And I think this is probably why Big Talbot Island is my favorite barrier island because I've been out there so much. I really enjoy kind of the pristine aspects of it. So let's go ahead and start taking a little bit of a look at, you know, the archaeology and history of, of Big Talbot Island. The first thing I want to talk about is just a little bit at the northern end of the island. So everyone knows the northern end. I think you can see, probably see my little arrow here. There's about a two and a half mile stretch of shoreline that fronts the ocean. So we know that there are archaeological sites there. And what's sad about it is these are eroding away on a regular basis. So what you can see here is if you've been to the bluff areas and all those areas along the ocean front, you can see all that erosion going on. So not only are we losing the uplands of the island, we're also losing parts of archaeological sites, that there has really been mass destruction to these sites due to the erosion that is going on. So back a few years ago, the state park came to us with an idea of, hey, can you guys give us an idea of what's actually on those bluff lines and how far back does it extend? So what we did, this was in 2017, I was there with students, we walked the shoreline looking for artifacts, okay? Once we did that, then we went up onto the mainland part and we did shovel tests. And these are small little tests that we dig into the ground to give us an idea, is there any archeological remains there? And if there are, what are the boundaries to them? How far from the bluff line do they extend inland? So we were able to find that there were three archeological sites that the state had already known about, but we were able to determine how much of those still exist. What again is really kind of sad is when you look at it, we did a GIS project in which we took aerial photographs beginning in 1943. So at a period of time like 1943, 1960, 1970, 1980, uh, 1990 and the present, we geo-referenced them, meaning we found a spot where we could basically tie them all into and then we overlaid them. What we have found out is that there is over 200 meters, 200 yards of erosion since 1943. So this shoreline here in areas, we've lost as much as two football fields of it. So we know that there are archaeological sites or portions of archaeological sites extending farther out towards the ocean, but they're gone. I mean, over the years, I've walked the shoreline, both line and seen shell mins there, and then I come back a month later and they're gone just because of the natural erosion uh, that is going on there. Um, some of you may or may not have seen this. This is along that bluff line area. This was in 2015 and 2016. Not only are there archaeological sites that are Native American along this area, there was actually a 19th century plantation that was out there. It was called the Spicer Christopher Plantation. And they had a well. So this is the casing to the well that is eroding out of the wall there of the bluff line. And it's out of brick. 
So when we were able to get out there a year later, this was already gone. It had already eroded completely away. And then today, I would say that this bluff line right here is probably another 10 to 15 yards beyond that. So this was completely lost. It was only out there for a short period of time. The state came in. They kind of tried to stabilize it for a while. State archaeologists, they recorded it. So it was recorded. But we're losing a lot of our cultural history due to the natural erosion that's going on on the northern part um, of the island. So really what I want to talk about is going to be the farther southern part of the island. This has really been the focus of all the archaeology that we have done there. I really like this map here. So here is Big Talbot Island right here. Uh, to the south, this is Port George Island. All those little clearings and those lines you see there, uh, when this was taken, those were the fairways to the golf course that were there. Um, so what we're going to focus on talking about is going to be this southern third of the island. So we come onto the island through A1A. Really, we're looking at area to the south. And this is the area that we've done extensive archaeological work since 19... I think um, there are some people that have been in the waiting room. Can you let them in, or do I have to do that? Lisa? I've been letting them in. Okay, so I don't have to worry about you it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, but he's the host. He, you can't let him in now. He can only let them in because he's the host. I've been doing it. Don't worry. Okay. All right. Sorry about that interruption. So this is kind of giving you an idea of what we've really done and what we're kind of learning about it. And I am going to focus on these two communities. One's called the Grand Shell Ring, and it'll date to about 1000 AD. The other one I'm going to talk about is the Mokama Tumukwa village of Cerebay. And we know that it existed from about 1565 into the first decade of the 1600s. All right. So what we did, a lot of times people ask me, how did you know to dig there? Or how do you know that there's an archaeological site in that location? So what we did when we first went out there in 1998, we decided, hey, we need to just understand the most basic aspects of the archaeology of the southern half of the island. So we did what's called a shovel test survey. And so what we dig are 50 by 50 meter centimeters shovel test right there. We dig them every 25 meters and then we record what we find. So what you see on this map here are all these little round holes are 50 centimeter square shovel tests. The ones that are solid means that we found Native American artifacts within them. The ones that are more open like this, meaning there were no artifacts found. So by doing this, we get an idea of what's being found. We have a grid, so we know the coordinates for every shovel test. So horizontally, we know where we are. We went from the ground surface to about a meter or three feet Low the surface, we recorded everything, we analyzed all the artifacts, and then we can kind of create distributional maps. So what we learned from this initial kind of shovel test survey of 550 shovel tests is that really from about 1 AD to about 800 AD, there's really minimal evidence of any kind of Native American activity. There's a little bit of pottery kind of loosely scattered over that area, but really not much at all. However, things change about 900 AD, and what we see is we're going to have really strong occupation from 900 AD into the 1600s. It's a little different. From 900 to 1250 AD, we're probably going to see villages. From 1250 to 1450, they seem to just be moving all over the island. And in fact, we have sites that date from 1250 to 1450 at the northern end. We don't have sites dating from 900 to 1250 and later ones at the northern end. So then we get this really strong occupation again in villages, probably about 1450 AD. And this is the Mokama Tumukwa that we knew about. So what I'm going to do is kind of give you an example of each of those kind of village communities. One that dates to a thousand years ago, and one in another location that dates to when the Europeans first arrived in the 1550s. All right. Well, the first one I want to talk about is the Grand Shell Ring. We have 10 radiocarbon dates. We have really good dating on it. It dates from about 900 AD to 1250 AD. Just to make this simple, I'm just going to say it dates to a thousand years ago. All right. Um, what is a shell ring? A lot of times people want to know, visualize what a shell ring is. This is not a drawing of what grand looks like, but probably going to be similar. And what we mean, it is a massive pile of oyster shells that are in a circle. Sometimes ring is a misnomer. It doesn't have to be a complete circle. It can be kind of more of an arc. It can be more of a horseshoe. It can be more of a C or a U shape. But grand is a complete circle. It's really more of an oval. 
So what we will see with brand is that they are intentionally piling shell and other garbage for the height in areas of probably about three feet. Other areas, it may only be about a half a foot, all right? So it goes in a circular shape and the grand from this outer point here to this outer point here is roughly about 65 to 70 meters or yards, okay? In the interior, it's probably about 30 to 35 yards. So that means these ring walls are about 10 to 15 meters or 10 to 15 yards wide. So this is a pretty large kind of construction that's going on. They're not just haphazardly throwing their garbage away and it kind of lands in this circle formation. This is an intentional construction that's going on here. And this is um, it here. So we right here, I'm taking this photograph, we're standing inside the ring. I know it's hard to see in this two dimensional drawing, but this is in the lower center part and then it's rising up right here. And these trees are probably a couple feet higher than this area right here. So the ring is kind of coming around in this area here. It's a great environment. It's a nice maritime hammock environment. What you see here is a lot of work with the uh, Tumuquin trails, with the state part of clearing this. When we did first did our archaeology here, it was so much scrub vegetation, we could hardly get through it. But over the years, it's been kind of cleared out. I think the state park one day wants to open this to the public uh, so that they can kind of learn about the history of the Grand. All right, a little bit of background on the Grand Shell Ring. The state first recorded it here in 1973. So the state went out there and they only spent a couple of days. They went out there and did this really crude sketch map. So there's our ring right there, which would be the shaded area would be our piled shell. Okay, again, about three feet at the highest point. What makes this different than all other shell rings that have been recorded along the Atlantic coast? It has a burial mound on top of it. So really the grand shell ring is a shell ring and burial mound complex. Um, the state came out in 1974, dug just one test in there, really productive, and then they nominated it and it's on the National Register of Historic Places. But really, that's the only archaeology that had been done there. One test dug in 1974. So this really interested us at the University of North Florida. It's a time period that I'm really interested in. So we got Mike Rousseau with the National Park Service, and he came out and did a really detailed topographic map of the area. So this is it again. Um, this part that's kind of in the brownish yellow, that's the shell ring. These areas are really high spots on the shell ring. And then this right here, that's the sand burial mound. This is a much more accurate representation than this one up here to the top. Also, there's a depressed area right here next to it. And this is where the sand came from for them to build the sand mound that's on top of it. Okay? So, again, these colors are kind of crazy colors. But this is a nice plan view. So we're kind of a bird looking down on the grand shell ring. Again, this part here is the shell part. This is the open plaza area. Here's the sand mound. And then here is the borrow pit from where the sand came from to construct the mound. So like I said, the highest point here, this is a little over a meter above ground level. And then another two meters, another six feet, would be to the top of the shell ring, to the shell mid, to the sand mound, I'm sorry. So from the top of the sand mound to the um, top of uh, the bottom of the interior plaza, we're looking at, that's about, that's about 10 feet, okay? So this is the work that we've done. We've done a trench through the shell ring here in 2006. We did some shovel tests right here, a little exploratory test into the mound and into other parts of the shell ring. And then we did another trench here. And then we did a larger block in the interior and a couple along the exterior. All of these were done in conjunction with the state park, uh, with Big Talbot Island State Park and with the state park system. The goal was to try to learn about the shell midden, the shell ring, when was it constructed, maybe how was it constructed, constructed, and then can we get maybe an idea of what it was used that was really our goal guiding all of our work. We kind of focused on this side because the park was thinking about potentially bringing a trail in here that would kind of come along and have a boardwalk on the back side. We had wanted to put a trench right here where the 19 is, but there is a massive um, live oak there, so we had to just do a smaller test because of the root complex just off of it. 
So we have some nice little collection of data from different locations. We have radiocarbon dates from all areas of the shell ring. So we know conclusively that the shell ring dates between 900 and 1250. All right, that's the only time represented in pottery. And that's the only time represented in terms of the dates that we have. All right, so this is the, the sand mound. And it looks like a typical sand mound. You can see it right here. Got a couple of large trees growing on it. There are some old holes that were dug into it, probably by pot hunters, people trying to loot it back in the 60s. Uh, the state park is doing a great job kind of maintaining and protecting it. With the state, they uh, allowed us to do two small little tests on the side. What they wanted us to do was to just document that it might be a burial mound and to see, is the shell ring underneath it? We weren't sure did they have the mound and they built the shell ring kind of adjacent to it and around it, or did this go directly on top of the shell ring? And what we did learn is that this mound is on top of the shell ring. So they build a section of the shell ring, probably a shell platform. Then they begin to construct the mound. And as they're constructing and utilizing the mound over the next couple hundred years, they're adding on to the shell ring. So they're both being kind of worked or constructed concurrently. So our earliest radiocarbon date actually comes from the shell ring that's beneath the sand mound. So that's why we're kind of interpreting it that way. Uh, we did get colored sands in here that showed us that it was a a uh, construction. And then we also got a human tooth once we found we stopped, followed all the protocols and did no more excavations. So we are confident it is a burial mound, but we don't want to touch it anymore. We want to give it its respect. So we stay completely away from any archaeological work within the burial mound itself. So this is one of the trenches that we dug, just to give you an idea. It's a pretty slow process. It's pretty arduous work, but this is solidly packed shell. And it's not just shell, there are broken pieces of pottery, there are incredible amounts of animal bone that are in here. There are other types of refuse that are in here. So they're actually placing garbage, not the shell, but garbage to form this ring. So you can see the shell that's loose here. This is what we've screened. Here's the trench that we're digging. It's a meter wide, roughly three feet. You're digging it in two meter or six sections. So we're keeping really tight, both horizontal and vertical control because we are destroying this archaeological site. We're destroying this section of the shell ring. So our goal is to really dismantle it as methodically, methodically as possible so that we can record where everything comes from. So I think these are just giving you an idea of, of what it's like. So here we are within this great maritime forest environment. We're on the outside of the ring right here. Can't really tell, but this is rising up to the top of the ring. That would be the interior of the ring back here. So this was our smaller one that just went to the middle of the ring. The one we dug over here went all the way through. It was 14 meters long. This one is 10 meters long. So we're slowly digging, we're screening, we're recording everything. And here you can see it's getting a little bit larger. And then here it is. So you can see in this end of it here, that's probably more than three feet of shell that's in there. Um, you can see it coming here. We actually have a pit. This black area is all the organics that are in the shell minute. When it rains, they kind of leach out and it stains this naturally gray soil, light gray soil. That's all stained with the organics that are leaching through here, okay? So we've excavated that, we'll take that out. We have a nice little pit that was dug here early on that is filled in with shell, okay? These are showing you, you know, we're getting big pieces of pottery that's coming out of there. We're getting lots of small, small fish bone. These three things here are actually three dolphin vertebrae. So we're getting really a wide variety of important kind of information that's coming into this. And it is garbage. So our question was, is this like, everyday garbage or is this maybe specialized feasting garbage and what we think it's both types of garbage that are going in here that these are the byproduct of feasting and the byproduct of them just basically throwing in uh, more everyday kinds of garbage. now we also wanted to dig in the interior of the ring so the ring would be back here behind us right in this area here that that tree is on the ring so this is on the inside. What kind of information can we get there? Is there any shell? Is there any artifacts? Is there a small amount of shell? And what we found out that there is a small amount of shell. It's scattered in this area. There is some pottery. There is some animal bone, but nothing in terms of 
quantity or variety as we see within the shell ring itself. This is probably one of the most interesting finds from the interior of the ring. We got a large section of a juvenile deer, all right? And this is the pelvis to the deer. And we noticed these three puncture marks and we weren't sure what they were. Then we got a alligator skeleton and realized that the teeth fit perfectly with this deer pelvis. So either they had killed the deer and an alligator tried to leave with the deer carcass, or they took the deer carcass from uh, the alligator and it was buried within this area. We got no evidence of the alligator itself, just the fact that it had it had hold of the um, hind quarters. Um, just to give you an idea of what we're getting out of there, incredible amounts of bone. What is great for us as archaeologists, when they throw their garbage away, particularly the vertebrate bone, the animal bone. So these are these are uh, the white things here. Those are crab claws or invertebrate. But all the rest are various types of fish bones. And the reason they preserve is when they throw it into these shell bins, when the calcium from the shell leaches out, these bones actually absorb that calcium, so they preserve. So these bones are a thousand years old, and it, had it not been for them being kind of thrown into that shell midden matrix, they wouldn't have preserved. We get great information on what they're eating. Lots of catfish, mullet, as you can see here, a lot of the drums, uh, redfish, black drum, croaker, sea trout. These top ones right here, probably about 98% of what they're eating are these fish, and then smaller amounts of these other fish, like and flounder. Uh, bluefish, cutlass fish, pompano are more on the ocean side. So we like them. We don't find those within other middens that are farther from, uh, from the ocean. We are getting mammals. So we had deer, we had rabbit, we had raccoon and opossum, but we did have a couple of fragments of bear, dog, and as we talked about before, mammal dolphin. All right. In terms of reptiles, we had mostly turtles, uh, in terms of Birds. We had a sandhill crane bone. We had a bald eagle, a red shoulder hawk, a vulture. But I think the most remarkable finds that we had were actually two extinct species of bird. So these were verified by multiple specialists. Okay, this is not us saying, oh, that's a great auk, or that's a passenger pigeon. Rochelle Marinin, who's a zooarchaeologist at Florida State University, identified him first and was pretty confident. Then she had an ornithologist look at them and verify them. So one's a great auk, which is an extinct, flightless, kind of large bird, swimming bird that's really confined to Arctic and subarctic water, water, northern water. And then we have passenger pigeon. Uh, the French talked about these as the sky is darkened with all these flocks of passenger pigeon. But this is the first documented recording of finding passenger pigeon bones in what we can so Those are pretty, pretty kind of remarkable finds. And then we're getting other things. We're getting pottery. Uh, up on the left are going to be, this is kind of the everyday pottery, mostly check stamped and plain. But we're also getting this really nice pottery. These here are stamped and they can be produced pretty quickly. These here, they're actually taking and they're polishing and burnishing them. So they have this kind of sheen or gloss to them. And then they're decorating them individually with like a stylus and they're making little incised lines and punctation marks on them. So we call these fine wares because they're really they're of a higher quality and they take a lot longer to produce. These here have this little woodly line right here. And for the longest time, we weren't sure what it was. And we finally have solved it. That this is the inner lip of a small oyster drill shell that they're taking and they're pressing into the wet clay to keep that design. And then we're also getting other shell that's not just shell refuse. That we're getting larger, these uh, right-handed or knob welts in which they are making large pools out of these, but then they're taking the outer world here, and they're making beads. So here you can see the bead where it's completely drawn, drilled through. And this one here, it's not. They haven't started, so this is a blank. So we got some evidence that they're producing shell beads. Here's a large bead right here, and this is from the Cayumela, this large, thick kind of center spine to it that's a spiral. That's called a Cayumela, and that's a Cayumela bead. So we have various other types of artifacts as well. Last thing I want to say about the Grand Shell Ring, what, why did they build it? What does it mean? How is it used? We don't know, but we are going to offer some potential interpretation. The first thing, 
Here are pictures of shell reefs. What is interesting, along the Atlantic coast, probably from South Florida, so this is the Atlantic coast of southeastern United States, from South Florida into South Carolina, we see all these different types of shell reefs. You can see some of them are nice circles, some of them are U, some of them are other shapes, but they all have some sort of arc to them, so they're considered to be a shell ring. What is interesting is that the fluorescence for building these is 2550 to 1600 BC. So 2000 years before the construction of the Grand Shell Ring is when these were invoked. So they stopped in 1600 BC. No one's building them. Then all of a sudden, two, almost 2000 years later, at 1000 AD, 900 AD, they start building the Grand Shell Ring. So why is that? And this is only one. This is a one of a kind piece of St. John's Street architecture for this time period along the Atlantic coast. All right. So what we think might be going on is they may be trying to kind of revive or reenact an ancient tradition, you know, or practice. So they may be trying to recreate a tangible piece of the past within their own ceremonial history. So what's interesting is the largest shell ring that was known is on Fort George Island. So the largest shell ring along the Atlantic coast is this one right here. So Native Americans were very acutely aware of the built and natural environment around them. They knew what was human made and what was natural. So they had probably seen these throughout the year. And for some reason, they decided to start reconstructing one, okay? So basically this was probably a commemorative act in which members of the community were involved in like uh, a community wide event, solidarity, in which they are kind of creating a tangible visual replica of the past right there within their community. And it's within the ceremonial area of their community because we're going to add a layer of sacred to this, this to this by putting a burial mound on top of this. This is something that was never done during the late archaic period, during that 2250 to 1600 BC period. So what it looks like we have is there's a pretty large St. John's Two community from 900 to 1250 along the southern part of the island. And the Grand Shell Ring is kind of their ceremonial hub. So there were probably social gatherings there in which people came to feast, in which people came to perform ceremonies, in which people were buried within the burial mound. And there were probably these commemorative acts of rebuilding a, a monument of the past right there in their, in their midst. And they're probably maybe contributing at times their own garbage into it as part of this kind of solidary movement among them. And then they're also building a mound on top of it. So it's probably the ceremonial ritual um, sacred portion of a much larger community along the south end of the island. All right. So what we see happening based on all the work that we've done, about 1250 AD, the ring is kind of abandoned. And that community that we see along the south end of the island really becomes much more dispersed. That they change, they start making a new pottery type, and now they seem to be moving around in much smaller groups all over the island and probably on the mainland. So they're not in their more of their community uh, formations. So that happens for about another 200 or so years, years. Then what we see is they start to come together again in more of a village structure. And this is going to be what become the Tumukwa or the Mokama that we know about. So while the Grand Shell Ring is kind of on, there's a road that runs down the southern part of the island called Houston Road. On the east side is mostly where the Grand and the St. John's Two community was. 200 years later, the community is going to be more on the other side of the road. Of course, the road was not there 500 years ago. So real quick background on the contact period to try to contextualize what I'm going to tell you about this village is that May 1st, 1562, probably the rhythm of daily life for the Mokama or the Tumukla were here halted. And so this is when Rubo arrived. Rubo was here only a short period of time, probably no more than 24 hours. So it's a very brief exploratory visit. He seemed to meet with Native Americans on both the north side, Alamakani, probably Fort George Island, the south side, Mayport, Satariba. Okay, so it's brief, exploratory, and then he moves on. But the long-term impact to the natives here is going to be disastrous. That within 150 years or so, they're pretty much gone from this area. They're gone as a viable route 
Uh, their bloodlines may continue on with other groups, but we no longer see the Mokama or the Tsumuka uh, themselves. So I like to use the word Mokama. Everyone probably heard that they're Tsumuka. There's nothing wrong with Tsumuka. The first thing I want to say here is we have no idea what they call themselves, what their self-identifying term is. Any term that I or anyone uses for them are ones that have been imposed upon them by outsiders, whether it's the French, the Spanish, or, or modern research. We know that the language they spoke is Tamukwa, okay? So Tamukwa is spoken to this broad area, okay? Uh, northern, eastern Florida, and southeastern Georgia. We do know that the dialect that was spoken here in the Jacksonville area is called the Mopama dialect. Mopama is an indigenous word, and it means sea, S-E-A, or ocean. So this became known as the maritime dialect of Tamuqua. And it did differ from the dialect that was spoken by Saloy and others to the south in St. Augustine area. They spoke another coastal dialect, and it was known as the Agua Salada dialect. So we have kind of the maritime Mopama and the saltwater dialects of Tamuqua. And we know this because there are, as it says down here, 2,000 pages of bilingual text that's written in Tamuqua and in Spanish that Aaron Broadwell, who's at the University of Florida and others before him, have been studied. And a lot of these were written from San Juan del Puerto, which is on Fort George Island, uh, Fort George Island State Park areas where the, that mission was. All right, so if I say Motama, it's just a specific dialect that was spoken here. Uh, just to let you know, this right here, the southeast coast here, the Atlantic coast, this is ground zero for the initial French and Spanish efforts. The Mokama, the Wallings coastal groups, they are going to bury the brunt of this initial contact. They are right there on the front lines, and it's going to hit them hard in a lot of different ways. A um, couple of things about the Mokama. Again, just to give you a little background, I think these are three kind of recurring themes that we see in the documents, and I feel pretty comfortable that to some extent they're going to be true. Okay, So a couple of things we see is, they seem to have institutionalized inequality, that there are hereditary leaders, that you are in the proper bloodline to become a chief or become an elite. And according to the documents, that's the deer clan. You have to be a member of a deer clan. They reckon relationships matrilineal. Okay, so that means if we were Tumupa or Mohama, our clan affiliation would be the clan affiliation of our mother. And Mothers and fathers always have to be, you know, husband and wife always have to be from different clans. You can't marry within the clan. You always take the identity or the clan affiliation of your mother, right? So we do see that there are these ranked clans that you are born with a degree of status. You may be able to increase that status in certain ways, but you'll never be able to increase it. You can't be probably become the main chief or locked up. You feel confident now that they live in villages? that they are living in these kind of really kind of communities. They are village or town dwellers, okay? And then the third thing is, I think the documents really push the point that they're growing lots of corn. I'm not convinced that they're growing lots as much as the French and Spanish say. They may be. I know they're growing it. There's no doubt about it. We're just not seeing that much of it in archaeological context. So I think they are still strongly fisher hunters and gatherers, but they have added corn gardening, probably beans and squash as well. One thing we feel pretty confident about is they're not adding corn to their kind of economy or their, their, their subsistence regime until about 1450 AD. So they're not growing corn until decades, just a few decades before Juan Ponce de Leon arrives along the Melbourne area of Central Florida, of Central Atlantic of Florida, right? And we know that because we're dating corn. We actually have corn data. We're dating the cobs that preserve. We're dating cob mark pottery by looking at the soot. And all those dates that we have, when we look at the standard deviation, which means this range is a 98% chance that the date falls in that range, it is never earlier than 1950. So we feel really confident that corn is a really late addition uh, to their diet. Um, the French did return again for colonization. They're here for 15 months. The important thing I want to just mention here is in some of the documents that goes on the air, he mentions a village called Cerame. It's spelled many different ways, and eventually by the Spanish will become Cerame. 
And in reference to Serenade, in one instance, he says that the cornfields are ripening at this point in time. In another one, he says that we go to the vicinity of Serenade quite frequently to get clays to make our brick, bricks for their ovens or some of the some of the foundations that they may have there, their houses. But they seem to like the clays that were in this area. We see him referencing that he, they would have saw him, Serenade, uh, would have been at meetings and parlaying or interacting with Serenade, the principal chief within the area. So we do see this community of Serenade uh, referenced several times in the French documents. Not a lot of specific information about it, but we do see it present. If we move forward a couple of decades, the Spanish will eventually take over Fort Caroline. They'll rename it San Mateo. They'll occupy it for a couple of years. So they're here living among the Mocama until about 1568. Then they're out of this area. Then they return again in 1587. And when they return again in 1587, they establish a mission. They establish a mission of San Juan del Puerto on Fort George Island. Then they establish another mission of San Pedro de Mocama on Cumberland Island. What's important for us is that in 1602, the priest who's living at San Juan del Puerto on Fort George Island, he writes a letter. And this letter has preserved. And basically, it's a letter. It's kind of, this is the state of affairs at my mission. And in it, he talks about how he's bringing lots of Native Americans into the fold. He's converting them. And honestly, we don't know what conversion means to the Natives themselves. We know what it means to the priests be baptized and so we think they're converted. We're not really convinced they may not be fully converted. But he also mentions that there are nine Native American communities that I visit on a regular basis, that I instruct them in the Catholic language, language and that I interact with them. And there may be a chapel built at them. So here are the nine that he lists. One of them that he lists is Serebe. This is undoubtedly the serenade from the French documents. Okay, Veracruz, we know where Veracruz is. Veracruz is on National Park Service property near Cedar Point. San Pablo, we're pretty confident San Pablo is in Queens Harbor Yacht and Country Club. The other ones, we're not sure where they are. One that was closest to him was Cerebe, and we believe Cerebe is Big Talbot Island. Okay. So just a quick map here. Here's Little Talbot Island. Just to let you know, when the French and Spanish were here, the majority of Little Talbot Island wasn't here. It didn't exist. It was some sort of you know, either sand dune or spit or something like this. The top part in Long Island definitely has some age to them, but the main part wasn't. So what you had was San Juan del Puerto, which would have been here on Fort George Island. And this is where we think Cerro Bay was here on the south end of Black, I mean, Big Talbot Island. We think the community was probably much larger, but we think we have the core area and we're trying to find more of it. Uh, Veracruz and Santa Cruz, which is a later mission, are over here on Black. That kind of gives you the social geography here of the late 1500s and 1600s, where, where Cerro Bay kind of All right, just back to our shovel testing that went on. Remember, we dug shovel test, we recorded all the information. If we go back and look at our analysis, what we did, okay, we want to know where might Cerro Bay be. So what we did is we used various types of distributional software. Say, okay, we want to see shovel tests, all the shovel tests that produce pottery that dates to this time period. All right. So what we do know after all the excavations that have gone on at Big Talbot Island and elsewhere in northeastern Florida, I think for all archaeologists working in this area are in a consensus on this, that the pottery that being made by the Mokama from 1450 to 1600, we call it San Pedro. Okay, it's got a European name, but this is an indigenous native pottery. So this pottery we know dates from roughly 1450 to the early decade of 1600. Then they switch, and what we see is most groups after about 1610, 1620, start making San Marcos in the mission period. So in a way, this kind of helps us. If you find San Pedro, we know that we have basically a uh, contact Motama. If we find San Marcos on the island, we could have mission period Mokam. And we, we could also have mission period in the mission period Wally. But based on the documents, it seems to be Mokam. All right, so we can use these to kind of track where they are. If we get a few pieces showing there's some activity in the area. If we get lots and lots of it over a larger area, that gives us a strong indication that there is a Native American Mokama community there. Okay, so we're trying to find it. 
So just looking real quick at this, we noticed that just for San Pedro, just our 1998 shovel test, 71 of the shovel tests produced a total of 166 curves. We kind of looked at them. We have other better maps that can show this as a different display, but this kind of shows you that if it's got a circle or a triangle, that's large amounts of it in the shovel test. So we realized that we think the core area is probably right here. So it probably spread out over a large area, but the core area is in here. So we wanted to focus on that core area. All right, so this is in 1998, right after the shovel testing. This was one of our shovel tests right here. When we dug it, we got a stain there that really looked unusual. But it's so small, we couldn't tell where it was. So we decided, okay, we're gonna come back and dig a bigger unit. We didn't backfill, we just kind of put a tarp in there so we know where it was. So we're digging out a bigger unit to give us a little bigger window to so tell what it is. It spread out even more and we realized even this one by two meter unit's not big enough. So we're gonna to have to open a bigger area and that's what we do. Eventually, we're gonna open these two blocks over a two year period, 1998 to 1999. Right. And this is it. So this is our drawing of what we see in the floor when we're down about 40 to 50 centimeters. Okay, we've gotten down below any plowing that had gone on during the plantation period. We're kind of below any midden here. So we have the yellow brown soil, and then we'll have these stains that are there. And what we started to see here were a series of stains that we thought were maybe these pits that are in kind of the gray and the darker black look like they're post holes. So these have been wooden posts in the ground that when they decompose, they leave a stain. But the other thing we saw right here, the trench. And we think this is a doorway. So we think this is what's called a little slot trench where they're digging the trench and they place the post for their building in that. So what we think we have is an entrance way right here and then parts of the walls that go here. There are trees here, so we haven't dug it. So we only have a little arc section of here. Based on this, it probably has a diameter of about 20 feet, about little or six yards. All right, so I think this is it. I think you can really see it here. Can't you see this little line coming in, this little arc coming in? That right there is the shovel test. So we clip this in the shovel test. If our shovel test had been just a little bit over here, we probably would have gotten nothing, missed this entire thing. So we just clip a little part of that wall trench right there, which then enabled us to open up this bigger block and actually find this. So we have kids, we have posts, we have a living area, we have some sort of building, we're not sure what it is, but what had been right here that we just missed was on the inside of a wall was going to be a complete pot. I'm gonna to get to that in the next one. These are what some of the posts look like when we cut them in half. So we, we draw them in the circle that you look down on and then we cut them in half, you can see the straight walls in the bottoms here. So you can tell that these are not tree roots, that these are posts in the ground. Here's a pit right here with a gigantic piece of pottery right there in it. So these are cross sections of some of those pits and post mold to let you know what I mean by them. But this is what we got just on the inside part of the wall. And I'm just about to wrap up. I know I'm coming up on the time here. But right here, that is a pot, a complete pot, okay? And inside of it's a giant Atlantic cockle. And probably during the 19th century when the mule drawn plowing it, they hit this pot, not knowing it was there, and dragged other parts away from it. So it's scattered about. So this is what it is. This nearly complete pot, and inside of it is this gynolanic cockle shell with a square basically taken out of it. Um, also, we found charred pieces of corn. Uh, so these are corn cobs that are charred. We radiocarbon dated them, okay? We got Spanish artifacts, not large numbers, but this is Spanish olive jar. We got 18 pieces of that. These are these large amphora-shaped vessels that the Spanish would have brought over. They traded up with Native Americans like them because they're heavy, they're exotic. They probably use them for various types of storage. This is a Mexican red painted ware, which is probably a Spanish ware that they got for trade. And then we have this scabbard tip. This is brass. And so this would have been at the end of a, a sheath or either a sword or a dagger. So we do have small numbers of European artifacts as well. So we finished that work in 1998 and 1999. Noah's been fascinated with that area. So that we're out there now. So this is what I took last week. So I'm out there with a handful of great UNF students and we're starting to open up this area. 
So we're about 20 meters from where we were last year. I mean, in 1999. And we're starting to find the same thing. Great pieces. Here's some examples of San Marcos pottery that we're finding right now. Uh, here's a piece of red film, which in during mission period. So this is native made, but they're actually putting a slip on it, gives it a red coloring. And here's a piece, another piece of, uh, I think we have seven or eight pieces of Spanish olive jar, uh, as well. So we're 20 meters away. We're finding more stuff. We're trying to go a little bit deeper here to get to that soil where we can see do we have any more structures, any more post holes, any more pits. We're still a little high, so we've got to go a little bit deeper. So hopefully we'll find more there. So I think this is what we think it could potentially look like. I think this is more realistic than the debris engravings. That we're probably going to have an open area here in which maybe the sheep and the leaves live. There's a public council house. This is the thing that I would want to uncover more than anything, probably in Jacksonville, would be their political center, their, their council house. So that's why we're opening big areas in hopes that maybe we can check and find evidence of it. And then there would have been the small households kind of sprinkled throughout, but no wall around it or anything like that. So with that said, I know I'm a little long, but I just want to thank so many people. Um, I think I get to be a mouthpiece for all this great archaeology that goes on by UNF students. We get help from the State Park, from the Timothy Trails Foundation, from the Friends of Talbot Island, North Florida Land Trust, the Borgman families, and others on Big Talbot Island have been a great, great help. Um, and then um, the students. The students have just been great to go out there. They work hard. And they're really, sometimes I don't think they realize how much they're really contributing to our really understanding the work that that sometimes I do, that I, I get a lot of credit for, which I really need to keep. So thank you.